Hello, welcome to Sex Talk with Natasha, Wednesday nights, 10 o'clock. I think, I really think we need to come up with a jingle. Like It's true, we do. An Ellen jingle. I've said this before, but I want to come on like dancing and not pixelated like I see on the <laughs> <laughs> well, New goals, new goals. <laughs> Five years from now, right? We're not going to have any of these problems with technology, right? We're all going to have like amazing internet connections. There's going to be no lag. Exactly. Right? Like two years from now, I'm guessing we're not going to have any of these issues. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, welcome back to the show. I'm super excited. Tonight we have um, a great guest that I happen to know personally and professionally. Her name is Jennifer White. So happy to have you on, Jennifer. She is currently training to become a sex therapist. And um, so she's got some great questions for me tonight. And I'm excited to have her on the show. And we're going to talk about the art of seduction and how to kind of try to keep it you know, within a consensual sphere. So, um, so, you know, hang in there and we'll get to that topic here in just a minute. Uh, in the meantime, I want to just plug Sex Talk with Natasha. I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, my goals with Sex Talk is to provide a comprehensive sexual education um, ongoing experience program, whatever you want to call it, uh, for adults. I feel like most of us came from uh, dramatically um, insufficient sexual ed backgrounds and often more than not sexual negative backgrounds. So with a lot of messages and we still have tons of stuff that is, um, you know, on the, um, just, you know, in the media and our cultures and our religions and our families, just all over the place. You know, I, I will confess that part of my um, winding down is the awful habit of watching shows like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette and all these, you know, very, very, oh, uh, what do I, it's, it's embarrassing for me to even to admit that, but that's my, that's my moment of, of truth. And it's always surprising to me how these young, you know, people who are negotiating relationships, granted, it's a reality show and I understand this, but it's still amazing to me how many gender issues I see on that show that I'm like, really? Like 25 year olds are still saying that kind of stuff or consensual issues that I see, I'm seeing. And I'm like, really? That's still an okay way to try to, you know, get somebody to go out with you. <laughs> so, so I have this kind of idea that maybe the younger generation is better off than those of us who grew up, you know, being taught sex ed in the eighties or nineties, but I'm not so sure. And I'm not so sure that that's fair to base that on my bachelor viewing pleasure, but at the same time, it is kind of interesting. So I'm here to try to help give a resource for people to um, have good education. Um, you know, even in the mental health field, we have a lot of conflicting ideas and views in regards to sexuality. And it wasn't until I decided to delve into sexual studies that I started realizing I held a lot of biases and a lot of problematic um, thoughts and um, concepts, even though I was a merit practicing, licensed practicing marriage and family therapist. So it's been really an interesting journey for me as well. So if it's hard for me as a mental health professional to come across good information, I can't imagine what it's like for the public. So I, I would hope that it's a trustworthy resource for you to tap into. We try to make it super cost effective. So even if you subscribe at the highest level of, um, of a subscription for Patreon, you're really only spending what you would spend in one or two sessions with a certified sex therapist. So, um, and then there's lower subscription rates too, where you can still get access to tons of resources and things of that nature. So. I am um, super excited to be able to be providing this. It only works if, you know, people kind of tune in in bulk. So please, if you're finding this valuable, uh, consider becoming a subscriber at some level or another because um, I need subscribers to be able to make this worth my time and Ashley's time, our producer's time and uh, all of that. So hopefully you're finding it helpful so far. Please feel free to ask questions along the way. We want to hear from you. And I'm going to turn it over to Ashley, our producer, to give you just a little bit more info. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining. Um, we always look forward to spending Wednesday nights with you. So thank you. Um, for those that are just joining, this is an hour long program where the first 15, 20 minutes or so, Natasha's gonna teach us some, some cool stuff. And then we always bring our guest on for about 20 minutes or so. And then the last 10, 15 minutes, we like to leave it open to you guys. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to send us a, a message, email us, um, whatever you want, let us know. And then we can have Natasha give her thoughts on it at the end. Uh, the first 30 minutes are free for everybody on Facebook, but the entire episode is over at patreon.com slash sex talk with Natasha, where you can become a subscriber. And Natasha already talked a little bit about some of the benefits that you get by going over there. There's some great stuff. So go check it out. And if anybody wants to see Natasha professionally, you can go ahead and check out her online practice at Symmetry Solutions. And that's at symmetrysouls, S-O-L-S dot com. So now I'll turn it back over to Natasha. All right. Thank you. So Jen, Jennifer, she posed this great question. It's kind of like, how do you, um, you know, work with this idea of, especially in a long-term relationship, of keeping things um, playful and seductive and sexy, while also at the same time making sure that you are falling under what we call a consensual sphere. And a lot of people might not think of consent, you know, in long-term relationships. Sometimes I think we have the idea that consent is more important when you're first meeting somebody, when you're first negotiating, kind of, you know, when you're going to touch or kiss or have sex or do anything sexual in nature. Um, and yet, you know, in long-term relationships, I think sometimes we miss out on the reality that this is an ongoingly important conversation to be having. So I'm really, really glad that Jennifer posed the question in the way that she did, um, kind of conflating these two or interweaving these two concepts together. So I'm going to start off with just my, you know, if you know me by now a little bit, you know that I'm kind of a stickler for words and meanings and definitions. And this is one area where I'm kind of not. So um, as I was looking at the word seduction, I tend to have um, an implication of seduction as something fun and playful. And I think a lot of times people who are using those words um, like, hey, are you gonna seduce me tonight? Or, hey, you know, do you wanna seduce me? <laughs> or uh, things of that nature are kind of coming at that word from that space. So I am very comfortable with that. At the same time, I do want to just kind of put out there that the word seduction really doesn't come from the most of playful heritage. So the idea of seduction is more like, I'm gonna to try to get something that I want from you. And I'm gonna do that through this kind of seductive power. Uh, whether that's using my sexuality or my body or my resources or whatever it is that I'm going to use. So it kind of comes from this, it potentially has some negative baggage to it. So I just want to validate that, but not necessarily tell everybody you shouldn't be using the words seduction, especially if that's fun and playful in your relationship. So maybe, but if you are uncomfortable with it, maybe a better word would be flirtation. Um, and what I would prefer to talk about instead of seduction necessarily being a negative word is one of the six principles of sexual health, which Doug Braun Harvey talks about a lot, which is avoiding exploitation. And exploitation is a big, heavy word, dun, 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 feels very heavy. And yet we all kind of can fall pretty easily into exploitative patterns or behaviors um, without being, you know, like, uh, a sex trafficker or an abuser of some sort. So these are kind. So I want to just talk about some potential things that you maybe would think about not being an exploitative partner. And so if you're doing anything like deceptive or maybe calculated ambiguity, this is what I see on The Bachelor a lot, by the way, <laughs> calculated ambiguity, <laughs> which is, I, I know what I want. <laughs> But I'm not going to tell you everything about what I want to make sure that I get what I want, you know, type of um, kind of an idea. And so then it's very easy to gaslight from that perspective. I never said that, you know, right? I don't know why you would think that, um, you know, I wouldn't have sex with somebody else, <laughs> even though I told you that you were the most amazing, wonderful person. <laughs> I never contracted that with you, right? So I think that calculated ambiguity is something that uh, we don't want to use to obtain consent. 
um, you know, not caring necessarily about the welfare of the other person. Again, being very egocentric, like being very focused on self pleasure and self needs instead of really looking at how you're affecting the, the other person or persons that you're being sexual with. Um, maybe using guilt trips, you know, as part of uh, the, the seduction. So in other words, it didn't really, it didn't help me feel seduced when, you know, I was told by several young men in my past that, oh, but baby, you know, I've got blue balls now. So please help me out. I was like, yeah, that's not working for me. That's not very seductive, but it's kind of like guilt tripping me into making sure that you're taken care of or calling me a tease or things of that nature. Um, even like touch or sexual provocation without consent. And if we're going to be kind of gendered about it, sometimes this is something that women tend to do, like, you know, women touching the back of a man or, you know, leaning in and showing her cleavage or things of that nature that maybe, maybe he would enjoy that. Maybe not. I think sometimes we assume men want this type of sexual attention because again, we have a lot of gender stereotypes in our culture, but without consent, you don't really know. And so, um, and then men are not necessarily in a position culturally to be able to say, hey, I'm not comfortable with that because that seems kind of weird in our culture. It doesn't follow the narrative. Men are supposed to like those things. So you have kind of gender issues on both sides of how uh, scripts and narratives are typically used or the ones that we see in media, et cetera. Um, okay, so that's kind of my first point is just talking about the word seduction in general and maybe not conflating that with exploitation um, and if you're more comfortable using the word flirtation. Now, I want to hit just a few points before we get to questions on this idea of, well, then in a long term relationship, how do we make sure we keep this type of playfulness, creativity, um, present because quite frankly, a very typical complaint that I'll get from clients is darn it. I wish, you know, I wish our sex was like before we got married. Right. Or I wish that we our chemistry, you know, we were so into each other and so, um, into our, you know, we could make out for hours before we got married, you know, and now, you know, we just kind of get at it. And if we're done in 10 minutes and it's fairly routine and maybe even boring and, you know, eh, can't, why can't it be back like where it was before? Um, so my number thought, my number one thought on that is, well, I don't think that you're acting like you did before you were married. <laughs> so I don't know, before I was married, I put on probably more makeup or more, you know, I made sure I showered um, before I went out on a date, you know, or I uh, was excited and there was newness about it. And I prioritized, you know, planning a date and making sure that I was ready to go out on a date. And even if I'd had a, a hard work, you know, I'd get off of work early to make sure I'd get home for the date, right? Right. So I would prioritize, I would plan, I would um, talk, I would, I would do things that I'm going to call sexual hygiene. And I talk to my clients about this a lot. And I'm not talking about, you know, like making sure that your penis or your vagina is clean. I'm talking about, are you acting in ways that you would have acted prior to marriage? So, and, and I don't, I don't particularly want to shame anybody because I know there's lots of different preference out, out there. You know, and there's people that really, if they go to the bathroom in front of each other or fart in front of each other or whatever, go, you know, poop in front of each other, it doesn't really interfere with their sexual eroticism. And yet at the same time, I think for many, those kinds of things do. We become a little bit too familiar in our everyday life with one another, and we don't necessarily keep some of the mystery alive that we had prior to when we were dating. So most people probably didn't pass gas and belch and, you know, do some of these things during that courtship arena when the sex was hot. So I'm just saying there might be a correlate there that you want to pay attention to and to keep the seduction, you know, levels high and fun and eroticized um, with one another. My number two point about this is that, and it, again, it goes back to how we were before we were dating. If you're in your current relationship and you can't think of something that you're doing that's somewhat uncomfortable uh, to prioritize your sex life, 
then you're probably a little bit too complacent. So we, you know, when we're dating, we have all this, renew, you know, new energy, we have hormones going on that just kind of naturally get us into a point where we're going to do things that maybe we wouldn't normally do. Like, oh, I'm thinking I might buy some flowers or I might write a love note or I might spend more money than I'm used to spending or I might get a new outfit and I might work out. I might, you know, all these things that maybe we wouldn't naturally do, but those hormones and that excitement kind of drives us to those kinds of um, feelings and ability to shift our behavior. And then like anything, once we're used to it, once we're kind of in this kind of stable, nice place that we, a lot of us like to get to with a primary partner is stability. It can be very easy to step back from those spaces of discomfort. So uh, since none of us are married to ourselves or in long-term relationships with ourselves, um, I don't think, <laughs> I mean, we can have solo sex, but we're not in long-term relationships with ourselves in the sense of with another partner is what I mean, um, is that your partner is, is going to have either a different libido than you are, is going to have a different erotic template than you are, is going to have a different, you know, love language is one way a lot of people talk about it. Um, and so if you are not leaning into something uncomfortable, it probably means that the setup you currently have is way too focused on your comfort levels, right? And maybe you're ignoring some of the ways that your partner might really appreciate being um, playful or creative or seduced, if that makes sense. So be thinking about that. Um, and then number three, which I've kind of already talked about a little bit, is I, I really do think that it's important to plan and prioritize your relationship with a primary partner, whether that's contracting what is going to be consensual, which we'll talk a little bit about. In other words, you know, am I feeling pressure from you? Is your idea of seduction my idea of feeling pressured, <laughs> right, which is probably not going to work? Um, so that means we need to prioritize conversations. We need to prioritize contracting. Maybe we even need to prioritize going to see a professional who can help us navigate something that's become kind of toxic between us. Um, and both of us are feeling really hurt by, by this, you know, kind of ongoing toxic negotiation. Um, but it's kind of, and I say this a lot on sex talk, it's, you know, if you want to get a promotion, if you want to get in shape, if you want to build a new house, you have to sit down, prioritize it, uh, put consistent effort towards that and plan. And I know that all those things don't necessarily go and go um, with the ideas of, you know, this amazing, passionate, sexy thing that's just supposed to happen out of nowhere, which is kind of the script we're given about sex. And yet that's really a myth that we need to fight because it's not a reality of most long-term relationships. If you want heat and passion, and adventure and fireworks and spontaneity, you actually have to plan, which may seem a little, <laughs> a little like counter, <laughs> counter indicated, but it's actually not because planning is going to help you be in a space where those types of things can happen, um, which is again, what you did prior to your long-term relationship. You were in a space where you were open to those kinds of experiences and why it's typically hotter when we are not together for you know, 15, 20, 40 years. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be hot and there's lots of fun ways to have a great long-term relationship. Okay, that's my overall viewpoint on what this question brought up for me. And now I'd love to have Jen come on and share with us kind of what Am I even hitting on the question the way you want it? <laughs> what kinds of things <laughs> did you want to talk about that I haven't hit on? Uh, are there other questions that my thoughts or bullet points elicited, et cetera? Yeah, you, you hit on a lot of the things um, I was thinking about. Um, and just to give a little bit of background, I've been married for 17 years um, and I just, I, I, as, especially as I'm like studying more in this area, um, learning more about how to have a healthy sex relationship. I always, everything I learn that I want my clients to do, I want to make sure I'm working on too. 
Yeah. And so yeah. just so it's not like, <laughs> I'm not going to ask them to do things I'm not willing to, you know, and, and obviously there's going to be different values sometimes and that's fine. But, um, but yeah, I love, I really think it's important to keep this even, you know, after when it, long-term relationships, keeping that spark alive and making sure it's fun. And I know that I, I love to feel wanted by my husband and, and, and I, both sides of this, you know, there's periods of time where maybe he'll have the stronger sex drive or periods of time where I'll have, you know, the higher desire. Um, and rather than getting to a place where I'm complaining about it, I, I think it's fun to kind of plan things um, as far as yeah, yeah, negotiating, contracting, but also really putting the effort into making a nice date. Um, but sometimes my motivation is really to get sex from my husband. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make sure I'm respecting consent too, you know, because you know, you plan your anniversary or it's, you know, you're planning a fun trip and you do actually, I, I like, maybe I'll work out a little bit extra or I'll, you know, get my legs waxed or get tan, you know, and spending time to make sure it's a fun thing that he'll like. Um, all of that kind of this part of seduction, you know, planning and putting that much energy into it. Um, yeah. You bring up, I mean, that's a really good point. I mean, that's why you, you oftentimes hear the art of seduction, right? Like that's a common way to talk about seduction and, and there can be a lot of those things that go into the fun and, you know, bathing in certain type of oil or, you know, having your skin really soft or feel a lot of it is just kind of preparing yourself, you know, like, do I feel seductive, right? Do I feel sexy. Do I feel happy with where I'm at and I feel like, um, you know, I'm, I'm in a space where I'm open to erotic energy and sensual energy and sensuality. And at the same time, you know, you, you put a lot of effort, you know, I can see a scenario where somebody puts a lot of effort, they go get waxed, you know, they spend the money on the big dinner, they maybe get a hotel room and they're kind of expecting sex to happen, right? And now all of a sudden, if the other person isn't in that same space, there's maybe that pressure. Maybe there's a lot of like unspoken energy. Like the other partner's like, oh no, I can tell that my part, you know, they're wanting sex. And then if I say no, then we're going to have this huge little melodrama. Um, so that's a really good point as far as, you know, where, where do those lines get crossed? Where, how do we negotiate those things? How do we not, how do we set it up for an invitation but not necessarily um, shut the whole party down if certain things don't happen, uh, which is also, I think, a big reason why it's so important to redefine sex, right? So sex, uh, for a lot of people, especially heterosexual people, it means a penis is inserted into a vagina, you know, and there are so many other ways that you know we can learn from our lesbian partnerships and um our homosexual partner you know our gay men partnerships as well that there's just so many different ways to enjoy sexuality that don't necessarily have to include that um and how are we going to deem success versus failure so in other words if i didn't get to have an orgasm through penis vagina sex well then the whole night was ruined what a crappy anniversary we just had. Um, now I'm pissed off. Now you don't meet my needs. Now, you know, the other person's feeling um, exploited or like pressured. And well, you don't even care about my needs either, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And you're off to the races, right? As far as some of these kind of toxic patterns that we can get into. And it's very easy to get into these patterns. It, it's laced with wonderful intentions. <laughs> And yet can go awry very quickly. So, um, so yeah, I think that one, I mean, I want to talk about this a little bit more. I know we're almost at the end of our time for, for Facebook, but I want to give a little bit more suggestions. So make sure you subscribe so you can see the rest of the program. But um, I, I do think that it's important to talk about strategies, communication skills, uh, personal resilience, right? Um, coping skills, emotional intelligence. I mean, there's like 
20 different things we could probably talk about that helps people address these types of scenarios in healthier, more sex positive, more relationship friendly ways than um, the minute that we're disappointed or the minute that we, you know, we've got a show on the road, you know, something either has to happen or doesn't happen. And now we're, we're really suffering, unfortunately. Um, do you want to uh, ask any, any one question before I go off the air or do we want to just take it on from there? Jen, did you have any questions related to that? Um, I think it'd be good to explore ways because I think it's you mentioned being resilient and you know maybe not taking it personally. Obviously, respecting the no, but in addition to that, maybe not getting taking it too personally, yeah. even if we put effort into it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's where we're going to head next. Um, so, and Ashley, I'm guessing there's maybe some questions that have come in, which we will also make sure and address before we before we end the show. So if you've asked a question, make sure you also subscribe and, and get your yep. answer. And, um, and we'll take it from there. So Ashley, you want to take us away? Yeah, thank you, Facebook. We, it was always good to see you, even if it's for a short time. We are still going, obviously. Head over to patreon.com slash sextalkwithnatasha. All right. Thanks, Facebook. Bye. See you next week. Next week.